Welcome back to the Joseph Carlson Show. On today's episode, inflation came in hotter than expected, and this caused the market to sell off yesterday. We saw a big red day, one of the first ones in a long time. And surprisingly, major news outlets like the Wall Street Journal are not using this as an opportunity to spread doom and gloom. In fact, they say just the opposite. Rate cuts might be delayed, but that's not a reason to panic. We'll be going through what this rate cut really means for investors and what would be the worst and best case scenario. Now, we also have a viral video of Mark Zuckerberg himself giving a review of the Quest 3 versus the Apple Vision Pro. He used the Apple Vision Pro and he said, surprisingly, and I know that this is shocking as, as the owner of Quest, he likes the Quest better. He thinks it's a better product than the Vision Pro. We'll be looking at his review on this video. And then as this market goes up, we have one company that continues to go forward above others. It's NVIDIA. This company seems to be unstoppable. We have Gene Munster, managing partner of Deepwater Asset Management, saying that the AI craze will drive stocks twice as high. They're gonna 2X because of this. So obviously we have a lot to get to in this episode. Let's go ahead and jump in. Now, yesterday was an interesting day. We had the CPI report come out, which is the monthly inflation reading and it came out a little bit hotter than expected. The numbers weren't quite as good, which caused a bit of a market panic. On the day, my portfolio also gave up around $8,000 in gains. So it impacted my portfolio as well. So that was a bit of a shock and we haven't seen a day like that in a while. And I think it's important to figure out whether or not this was a one-time thing, a one-off event, or if it's an ongoing issue. The Wall Street Journal says that it's not much to worry about. They say how much does it matter if the Federal Reserve starts cutting rates in June instead of May? Not much to the broader economy or even investors, but that isn't how investors reacted on Tuesday's consumer price index report. The Dow Jones was down as much as 750 points. The Russell 2000 index, the small capitalization stocks, went down 4%. That does make sense because small cap stocks are extra sensitive to interest rates. The yield on the 10-year treasury also rose to its highest since November. The yield went from 4.1% to almost 4.3% in a day. Now again, this is because of the inflation reading in January and the impact that has on the Fed's supposed schedule. The inflation reading came in with 3.1% inflation from a year earlier. So prices went up 3.1% according to January's reading and investors and analysts and economists were expecting 2.9%. So we had an inflation reading slightly hotter than expected. As a result, investors are saying, all right, inflation's not coming down quite as fast as expected. That means the Fed has to wait longer before cutting rates. See, the way this works is investors always have predictions of interest rates in the future. This is what they think the federal funds rate will be at, and this determines the risk-free rate. This is the bar at which you have to judge your investments against because you can always buy the 10-year US Treasury. So as they plot out rate predictions in the future, that impacts the prices you're willing to pay for companies today. So with inflation being more stubborn and coming down slower than expected, the thought is higher for longer. Interest rates will remain where they are for at least a couple months longer than expected. You can see clearly that there's some companies that are more sensitive to high interest rates and inflation than other companies. For example, Costco is a company that does not really get impacted by inflation all that much. Because when inflation happens, Costco passes those costs along to the consumer. Visa and MasterCard are another two companies that have almost no impact from inflation. If consumers spend more money, Visa and MasterCard makes more money, and inflation causes people to spend more money on products. But not every company is as hedged against inflation and high interest rates. Vici has two different things that impact it negatively when interest rates stay higher. The first thing is opportunity cost. Many people invest in Vici because of the high dividend yield, 5.6%. Why would you have your money in Vici earning a 5.6% dividend yield when instead you can have it in an insured bank account earning a 5% yield? The second thing is inflation. Vici does have the majority of its rents hedged against inflation, but inflation still doesn't help Vici at all. Vici can't pass through all the costs the same way that Visa and MasterCard can. So yesterday was not a great day for Vici, causing the stock to go down almost another dollar. On the year, it's down 10% largely driven by higher interest rates. So inflation and interest rates affect companies to different degrees, but overall it does affect every one of them. Every company is worth arguably a little less when interest rates are a little higher. So this isn't welcome news to investors that interest rates are gonna stay higher for a bit longer than expected. And if you take a longer term perspective on inflation, the data still looks really good. Six months ago, core inflation was 4.7%. 
Now it's 3.4. So it's down over a full percentage point over the past six months. Goods inflation continues to be negative as price falls and such things as apparel, used cars, partly because of the unwinding from the pandemic shortages. There's a few niche categories where inflation was up, but overall on the biggest categories, it's headed down. This is one of the occasions where I agree with the major media. I don't think that this is cause for real panic. We see inflation continually coming down. The expectations were delayed a little, which does hurt some companies, especially ones that are sensitive to interest rates, small cap companies and ones like Vici. But overall, this is not a big problem right now. It's not a big problem today. There will be people that say, what if this turns into a big problem? What if inflation starts to rise again? There's always a speculative chance of things potentially going wrong in the future, of things unfolding in a bad way, but the data that we have right now shows that there's not a real concern. So as of right now, I'm not too concerned about this. Now moving on, I have to react to this video. This is a video from Mark Zuckerberg where he posted it on Instagram and it looks almost like it's an impromptu review, an unbiased review of him comparing the Apple Vision Pro against the MetaQuest. Now one important little piece of information, something you might want to take into account when you're listening to this, he is the owner of Facebook. He is the owner of Oculus, the creator of the MetaQuest. So he's reviewing one product of a direct competitor against a product that he created. But either way, let's go ahead and just take a look at it. All right, guys. So I finally tried Apple's Vision Pro. And, you know, I have to say that before this, I expected that Quest would be the better value for most people since it's really good and it's like seven times less expensive. Uh, but after using it, I don't just think that Quest is the better value. I think that Quest is the better product, period. That's the headline. Quest isn't just the better value because as he slipped in there, it's seven times less expensive, but it's the better product, period. A pretty bold claim for a product that is seven times less expensive. Now, one of the things I realized immediately when watching this video, doing YouTube for a long period of time, I know how difficult it is to give a really well-worded, well-articulated monologue that's over three minutes long without any mistakes or mess ups and getting all the points you want into a condensed, concise, well-written, well-articulated monologue. And what you're witnessing Mark Zuckerberg do here is giving a very well-articulated monologue. In my opinion, I think there's a high degree, in fact, I would be willing to bet on this, that this wasn't something where he just sat down and shared some thoughts. This was poured over by different people on how to best articulate a natural sounding, relevant sounding review in a three minute period. It's just so good. Everything he says is word for word perfect. That doesn't happen by chance. Mark Zuckerberg is a brilliant coder. He's a brilliant business leader, but is he really this brilliant of a speaker to be able to put this into one video? I have my doubts. When I look at this, I think it's just too good. And you know, the different companies made different design decisions for the headsets, they have different strengths, but overall, Quest is better for the vast majority of things that people use mixed reality for. Now, my friend Kenny is actually capturing this video on Quest's high resolution mixed reality pass through right now. We're, we're just here in my living room and you, know, you can see his, his browser windows and you know, whatever else he's got running up here. Uh, so yeah, Quest 3 does high quality pass through with big screens, uh, just like Vision Pro. But we also designed it to be great for a lot of other things, uh, moving around, playing games, um, hanging out with friends and socializing, working out, um, and more. Quest, you know, I think is just a lot more comfortable. Um, you know, we designed it to weigh 120 grams less, which makes a really big difference on your face. Um, there's no wires that get in the way when you move around. It's a big deal. Our field of view is, is wider, and I found our screen to be brighter also. See the list he goes through? It's so good. I, I really think he just nailed this. Now, again, I, I think that there is a lot of rehearsing, a lot of thought that went behind this, but I also think it was such a good review from Mark Zuckerberg, a good move by him. And one of the things that I like about this video is how natural he made it sound. He made this sound like he's just conversing with you in his living room. Many people that try to pull this off sound rehearsed, and that's the worst thing that can happen. So Zuckerberg delivers this breakdown in such a convincing manner. I also noticed that, you know, Apple's headset has this motion blur as you move around, which um, Quest is just a lot crisper. Quest supports uh, precision controllers that are great for games. Um, both headsets support hand tracking. But, you know, I found ours to be a little more accurate. I think he brings up a lot of good relevant points, but he also brings up some things that are a little bit suspect. Him saying that the hand tracking is a little better on the MetaQuest. 
I've watched a number of third-party reviews from people that have no stake in either of these companies, and consistently, without fail, they've said the Apple Vision Pro has better hand tracking. About the hand tracking. When the Quest 3 first came out, I was really impressed with the hand tracking. However, you do need to keep your hands kind of in front of you, and the Quest 3 can sometimes mess up in low light scenarios or straight up just not even detect your hands at all. However, with the Apple Vision Pro, it is a lot more consistent and you have a lot more freedom on where you want to rest your hands. So I found that even with my hands in my lap, on my side, you know, in places where I thought the Apple Vision Pro might have a little bit of trouble, it's able to track my pinches and my scrolls and swipes very accurately. That combined with the eye tracking, makes this a very intuitive and seamless experience. Every third-party review I've seen says something similar. He also mentions a motion blur with the Apple Vision Pro, which almost every review I've seen says that the Apple Vision Pro has better latency. It's a lower latency, which causes less motion sickness. So obviously there's a few biases being the owner of this company working its way into this review, but overall the marketing perspective of this video is very effective. But overall, one of the most confusing parts is seeing people react to this review is they act as though Mark Zuckerberg is not biased. Like he's just giving an unbiased, fair and partial take of his technology against Apple's, which obviously is not the case. And I think that people forget about the history that Zuckerberg has with Apple. There is no company on this planet that Mark Zuckerberg dislikes more than Apple. Even his own direct competitors like TikTok, he likes more than Apple. In fact, saying that he dislikes Apple is an understatement. Mark Zuckerberg hates Apple, and that's very clear throughout their history. And he has ample reason to dislike Apple. Apple. And this dislike between these two companies is mutually shared by Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. He equally hates Facebook. Both of these companies and the executives behind them hate each other. We saw Mark Zuckerberg's review of the Apple Vision Pro, so I think it's fair to see Tim Cook's review of Facebook. What kind of world do we want to live in? The fact is that an interconnected ecosystem of companies and data brokers, of purveyors of fake news and peddlers of division, of trackers and hucksters just looking to make a quick buck is more present in our lives than it has ever been. He is referring to Facebook, calling them brokers and hucksters of your personal data. It seems no piece of information is too private or personal to be surveilled, monetized, and aggregated into a 360 degree view of your life. The end result of all of this is that you are no longer the customer you are the product. So we have Mark Zuckerberg's review on the Apple Vision Pro, and we have Tim Cook's review on Facebook. Notice a commonality with these two companies. They don't really like the other person's products. Mark Zuckerberg is reviewing the product of a company that he's a direct competitor to, and a company that he has lost personally billions and billions of dollars to because of their ad tracking policies. Mark Zuckerberg wanted to continue tracking your behavior on a phone from app to app, even when you're off of Facebook. Tim Cook said that you can't do that. You have to have permission first. That costs Facebook a lot of money in ads. This isn't just friendly competition like Google and Microsoft. I view this as the best form of capitalism. Two companies that are both massive, both have incredible means that truly don't like each other. Now moving on, we've seen the AI craze get crazier and crazier. And this new move from Apple is just one more little step of solidifying that AI is going to be intermingled with every part of our life, every part of technology going forward. For better or worse, that is the future we face. Apple is doing this with a new model specifically made for photo editing. This is something that may be surprising because Apple has not yet talked about artificial intelligence to any degree that companies like Microsoft, Nvidia, or Google has. Apple has said that they have some exciting things down the road. Tim Cook just mentioned a bit of a teaser. He said he doesn't want to get ahead of himself, but there are some exciting AI things down the road, and it seems like this could be part of it. Apple researchers released a new model that lets users describe in plain language what they want to change in a photo without ever touching photo editing software. So you're not talking to it, you're rather texting it. You're texting the photo what you want to change about it, and it will on the fly make those changes. They say users just have to type out what they want to change about a picture. The paper used an example of editing an image of pepperoni pizza. Typing in the prompt, make it more healthy, adds vegetable toppings. So you can see the photo before and after. Typing make it more healthy apparently makes the pizza look a lot less appealing. 
The pizza on the left looks a lot better, even without the veggies on it. It just looks a lot better. But of course, there's more applications than that. There's another one they show of a photo that has a woman in the background. She's kind of photobombing the picture here, and you prompt it to remove the woman in the background. Now, this actually looks really good. It says the focus of the image would shift to the man's expression, and you can see the entire woman, and it looks like the whatever that object is there, the couch there, is completely removed. There's images of cheetahs that's a bit stale and dark, and the prompt is to add contrast to simulate more light. And there you can see the second photo is much better. That type of stuff is impressive in and of itself, changing contrast and different filters. But I think the more impressive thing is when it can identify specific objects in the photo and do specific editing on top of that. Like an image of a laptop with a white screen, and then the text prompt is to let the laptop have a green web page. And then the background of the laptop has a green website. And Apple seems to be making this model public, saying that it's going to be put on GitHub. So this is going to be available to everyone. All different photo editing softwares and phones will eventually have this type of technology built in. I think that this is obviously going to be a big growth path for a lot of companies like Apple in enhancing their already enormous ecosystem. Imagine if every tool that you have within the Apple ecosystem has some type of AI help to it photo editing, texting, every type of communication, that's just gonna enhance the already existing ecosystem. So companies like Apple, companies like Microsoft, already have a lot to gain from this. There's one company though that comes to mind that I'm a little bit concerned about with this AI trend. That company is Adobe. This is one that I sold out of a while ago because I was concerned about artificial intelligence and especially how targeted it is at editing photos. It seems like there's so many models that have to do with photo editing. But regardless, Adobe does seem like it's holding up well. Investors are not concerned. It continues to trade at a high valuation. And so far, the fundamentals of the company are fine. But this is one company I have on my watch list that I'm still trying to debate whether or not AI helps them or hurts them. There are some companies that AI is going to hurt, but there's also many companies that AI is going to help. Gene Munster explains why he believes that AI will eventually double the value of many already big companies. Investors have struggled about what to, how to kind of capture and guess what the impact is going to be. And my sense is that you need to put this on a spectrum of AI and its impact and other paradigm shifts. And I would put the PC at a 20, mobile 25, the internet 50, electricity at 100, a scale 1 to 100, electricity is at 100, AI is 99. It would be 100 if it not for you need electricity to power AI. So when you have that perspective, when I have that perspective, and I think about what's going on with these interest rates and inflation and where investors are in the near term, I think you can get kind of um, misled into worrying about what's going to happen over the next three to six months. And ultimately, if this is as big of a, a paradigm shift as I think it is, even if it's half as big, I think we could see the NASDAQ move up considerably 2x in the next two to three years. Now, I agree with him on his long-term perspective, not worrying about inflation in the short term. It's not just a buzzword. AI has cash flows behind it. It makes already existing companies better, more efficient, and have better value for customers. That will drive further value creation and cash flows for these companies. But I'm also seeing that two things can be true at once. AI is real. Lots of companies will benefit from it. And some investors are using the excuse of AI to drive different companies to incredibly high valuations. Companies like Nvidia have gone up so far, so fast for so long, that now they're bigger than companies like Amazon. Nvidia has a larger market cap. The company's up 50% this year. It hasn't even reported earnings this year, but it's still up 50%. Why? Well, because of AI, because it has momentum. Because last year, it was up 219%. And over the past five years, it was up 1,746%. The cash flows for the last two quarters have also been growing consistently, from $6 billion to $7 billion. Even if they earn $7 billion per quarter for the next four quarters, that's still at a free cash flow yield well below 2%. NVIDIA is currently priced with the expectation of continued rapid cash flow growth over the most recent quarters, seven billion. Now, I would never short a company with this much momentum and especially one producing products that the world needs, but I also think that investing in these type of companies is somewhat dangerous. Unless you were able to identify and see the massive influx in demand in Nvidia, I think it's going to be equally difficult, if not impossible, to identify and predict a collapse in demand. You may say that demand will never collapse, but I also think that that's unlikely. So while I agree with Gene Munster, I think that AI is gonna change the world, I also think that investors need to know history. Every single new groundbreaking technology, even real ones like the internet in 2000, has previously 
previously been used to justify irrational valuations for companies. And I think there's a chance we're doing that once again with AI. Now that's going to be all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one.